Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I'm Louise Palenker. As you're heading down the Media Path, considering your entertainment options, think of us as your Wave app to help you avoid the glut of items that aren't worth your while. (laughs) And a treat for you, as for us, is to get to talk to guests who have made their mark in their field. And nobody has made a greater mark in entertainment, especially in the area of children's programming, than Marty Croft, who with his brother Sid created Sid and Marty Croft Productions, producing historic shows like H.R. Puff and Stuff, which started in 1969 at NBC when I didn't start there, Land of the Lost, Lidsville, The Boogaloos, Electro Woman and Dinah Girl, Far Out Space Nuts, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, and a lot more. And Wheezy, we'll get to Marty in just a second. What have you got for us this week? So this week I've been watching The First Lady on Showtime. And uh, you've been watching it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So The First Lady ambitiously takes on the task of weaving together the parallel story arcs of Eleanor Roosevelt, Betty Ford, and Michelle Obama in an effort to show us how the title of First Lady affects each woman and how she in turn uses her role to affect the nation. Outcomes are naturally informed by each woman's personality, the political climate, and her relationship with her husband. As First Lady, much is expected of you while little is permitted, and the subsequent desires and frustrations of each woman impact her ability to maintain personal balance while positively influencing her generation. Much has been said about the actors' abilities to capture the essences of the iconic personalities they portray. There is, of course, some distracting mimicry required for the task, which could be why Michelle Pfeiffer seems to be receiving the most praise. She plays Betty Ford, whose speech and mannerisms are lesser known. Viola Davis is Michelle Obama, Jillian Anderson is Eleanor Roosevelt, and their husbands are Kiefer Sutherland as FDR, Aaron Eckhart as Gerald Ford, and O.T. Fagbenli as Barack Obama. Let go of your familiarity with the actual figures they portray and just take in the stories and the themes. There is much to enjoy and learn here. The First Lady is on Showtime. I love it. I'm, 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 I'm addicted to this show. And I love it because it drills down on some of the personal things we didn't know about the First Ladies. I think the most affecting one to me is the way they treated the um, uh, same-sex relationship that Eleanor Roosevelt apparently had with Miss Hickok, mm-hmm. who was her mentor and her friend. Now, they even do a disclaimer at the beginning of the show where they say some of this is fictionalized in order to make it really human. But I think that's a, that's a known fact that after her husband's infidelities became positive, she sought the solace of this woman and they became partners and lived in a house with five other women out somewhere else on you know in in uh, in new york but i i love that character i think jillian anderson is killing it with uh, uh with uh, eleanor roosevelt i love the michelle pfeiffer character because i think she's the most american i mean she stuck up for women's rights did it out of an office in the white house was chastised for it by his assistants and thrown out of the white house she put a face on breast cancer she put a face on pill addiction and i think women in america seized her and this tells the great story the michelle obama one um i i I, you beautifully phrased you know the physical characteristics i find that thing she's doing with her lips completely distracting uh and a little over the top but i but it really does put a point on what a strong woman she was and how she was the strength in the family and how her husband she was like the she was the rock of the family and had to you know be be strong and wasn't going to fall into the typical first lady role in her bouts with Rahm Emanuel. Like, no, I'm not going to be the first lady you want me to be. I'm a lawyer, you know. Yeah, so and, and she's proven right in, like, yeah. in, in many aspects of, you know, what it was that she was. You know, Barack was a, a politician, and he was con- always worried about midterms or re-elections or what have you. And Michelle was just really trying to... M- make a difference and move things forward. Yeah, yeah, and a smart woman, and it was great. And I think she had the same problem that Hillary Clinton had, being too smart for the role when America wasn't ready to accept that of her. Eleanor, Eleanor. too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you go. Well said, Marty. Yep. Well, my pick this week, I hope you like this one, Weezy, is George Carlin's American Dream. It's a two-part documentary, maybe the greatest stand-up performer of all time, George Carlin, streaming now on HBO Max. It's co-directed and produced by Judd Apatow and Mike Bonfilio. Judd produced, in my opinion, one of the greatest looks at stand-up ever, The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling, also a two-part series for HBO. Not just interesting, but profound. My opinion was at the time that every beginning stand-up should be forced to watch The Shandling Doc because it's about stand-up as an art form. Uh, 
And I feel the same about this one. It's named American Dream, which comes from a line in George's act, quote, they call it the American Dream because you have to be asleep to believe it, end quote. <laughs> Part one charts his early life as he transforms himself from the Vegasy suit-wearing impressionist, mainstream comic, to the bearded, jeans-wearing prophet philosopher that made him the legend we know. Part two gets into the genius of his act, and it shows long, uninterrupted pieces, and I'm so happy about that, so you get the full force of his writing. You're astonished at how prolific he was, what a disciplined writer he was. I think he holds the record for the number of HBO specials, over 10. It's a lot of stark truth about his relationship with his soulmate and his late first wife, Brenda, his daughter, Kelly, Sally Wade, who was his wife at the time of his death. Toward the end of his life, there were grumblings from his even his greatest fans like me, who thought he might be drifting to a little darkness. It seems similar to the way Lenny Bruce went toward the end, more bitching and moaning and less comedy. But when you set him against our current malaise in this country, you realize he wasn't too dark. He was just too far ahead of his time. Wow. We could benefit from his voice right now. George Carlin was the reason I wanted to do stand-up. My friends gave me tickets to see him when I was a freshman in college at the Valley Forge Music Fair outside Philadelphia. Not knowing the grunt work and the nuts and the bolts of preparing a stand-up show, I was rattled and spooked by this man's ability to get on stage in front of 3,000 people, seemingly off the top of his head, no notes, and to mesmerize and convulse an audience for 90 minutes. It was a religious experience for me. I've described it as my St. Paul on the road to Damascus moment, and my life is, was forever changed, and that's not exaggerating. It really was. No, it's I... a wonderful documentary. Wow. All right. All right. So let's introduce our wonderful guest. I can't wait to get to our guest. I've been so anxious to talk to Marty. Very few people have seen uh, the transitions in the history of television like this guy has. Uh, you you are uh, amazing. Marty and Sid got the last star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame before the pandemic. They received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Daytime Emmys, along with all the great children's shows they produced. These men literally created Saturday morning children's television. They also did primetime programming, the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, the Donnie and Marie Show, Barbara Mandrell, my favorite, DC Follies, which was a political satire show that we only wish was around right now. We're very happy to welcome Marty Croft. Marty, nice to have you. Uh, great to be here. Listen, you and your older brother. Always loved you. Oh, God bless you. I appreciate it. Well, uh, you and your older brother, Sid, have a fascinating start in show business. Talk about your dad discovering that Sid had an early and brilliant talent at seven years old as a puppeteer. He went to work for Ringling Brothers and even opened for Liberace and Judy Garland at a very young age. Great story. Well, that was it. That's, that's it. You know, my father probably started it all. And then my brother, who's eight years older than me. So I was still in school when he was in Ringling Brothers and other playing clubs at the end of vaudeville. So I joined him when he was beginning to work with Liberace. So, you know, we worked with Judy Garland for a couple of years. We were their opening act. Tony Martin, Dean Martin, you know, and on and on. We were, we always worked. We worked with stars. And before we made Puff and Stuff, we had a big track record. So we weren't just starting then. You know, when I was at the New York World's Fair with our adults-only puppet show in a thousand-seat theater, we were the only one that survived there. And one day, Dean Martin walked by the front of the theater, came inside, then asked for me and said, hey, do you want to be on our series every week? What do you think about being the girls in the show with your puppets? So, of course, that was incredible. So we got star billing every week with all the big stars that were, you know, hired for the, for the series. And, uh, you know, so that was a big thing. And then, of course, we had a club in New Orleans on Bourbon Street with the puppets. And we were at all three world's fairs, and we were always successful at the fairs. So that was all before Puff and stuff. And then Joe Barbera came to me and said, hey, we're doing something live, and we don't know how to do it. Would you guys come aboard? And it was the banana splits. So we created the banana splits. And while we were building them in our factory, the head of NBC, Coca-Cola, and Kellogg's 
they came a few times to see the construction, what was going on. So one day, Larry White, who was the head of programming at NBC, leaned over to me and says, why don't you do your own show? I'll pick it up. So that's how Puffin Stuff was created. But he, he existed the year before at the World's Fair. We did the Coca-Cola Pavilion at Hemisphere in San Antonio. So that, you know, he's called Luther then. So then we got him updated and we created the show around HR Puff and stuff. So that's how it started. It seems like you were you were the business mind be, behind taking a, a puppet act into like an a entertainment production company mogul type of space. And you kind of like hit that stride in the 70s when color, television, and everything just being vivid and, and, and more colorful than real life was the, the fashions. You guys were able to hit that stride simultaneously, correct? Well, what we did was we took, well, we went from an act, an opening act, to a company, which I did run and had more than one responsibility, mostly creative. But, you know, we did know we, we didn't know we were changing the face and they were getting rid of animation at the time. So we cost a few companies some show pickups. And, you know, our thing, you know, our shows were always known for color. And look, we went in and sold our shows without scripts. We did artwork. We went in with artwork. Oh. It got picked up. Okay. So that's how most of our stuff got, I, got I love up. I love your philosophy about pitches, too. In 69, you pitched NBC, and you said, you have to be able to do your pitch in no more than 90 seconds, or you're out of there, which is a great lesson for anybody. who We've pitched TV okay, shows together. No you're in a room with, let's say, Michael Eisner, and he has a phone call from his boss. He's out of the room. He has a phone call from his wife. He's out of the room. He gets a phone call that they just stole his car. So if you don't do it in like three minutes, you're done. So we learned to, to really, you know, to come to a conclusion as to what the show was. But some of it's and, real, it's uh, high con- concept stuff where like it's a, it's a fish out of water, it's a kid on an island. So what's the 90 second puff and stuff pitch? Well, you're asking me, I, I don't <laughs> have that, but that's a good question. It, it's going to remain unanswered. Yeah, it's but not. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the pitch. Yeah. I got the pitch. We did, we put together a book with about three, four pages. And uh, Larry White was in a plane crash, the head of NBC. And so he never took planes. So he took trains. And his office was in New York. So I said to myself, let me go out to Union Station was on a Friday, see if I can find his train car and give him this book. Wow. So I'm at the information counter at the Union Station, and I said, where do I find train 3740? So he, I said, he said, well, what, who are you look, looking for? I said, Larry White. As I'm saying it, I get an elbow into my side. Larry White was standing right. <laughs> so I gave him the book. There was no phones on on air on, on uh, trains, mm-hmm. and uh, I knew he would be looking at this over the weekend. Mm-hmm. So on Monday he called me. He said, "Okay." Wow. Wow. So you you have a fearlessness to you as well. Like you know you're good and you're going to go for it. Well, you better have no fear when you're doing this job. Mm-hmm. You know, you you better not walk into a room and start shaking with a network and getting right into your pitch. Mm-hmm. So we never had to do that. So you HR know? Puffin stuff was one of the, one of the, uh, it was your breakthrough one. And, and part of the, uh, the brilliance of that show was your casting. Talk about Jack Wild, where he came from and how you got him. Well, Jack Wild, uh, my brother went to a opening, one of the previews of Oliver. And uh, Jack Wild was the artful dodger in that. And uh, I can't think of the guy that did the music he was famous. Uh, uh, Lionel Bart. Lionel, you're right. So Lionel Bart knew my brother. He actually asked my brother to go see him. 
So then my brother, of course, came to me and said, go and get Jack Wilde. Well, my brother always said this. He <laughs> left LA three times. So yeah, I said, you know what? Why don't you go? He said, no, I want you to go. I said, look, I've got two kids and a wife, and you asked me to go to London. So I went, and ultimately, uh, his man, I bonded with the manager. You know, he, he was called Hemdale, David Hemming's company. And so I brought Jack Wilde back to L.A., put him up. He, he got the Oscar nomination, you know, and all of this was going on. I got him for puffing stuff. And then I took him to the Academy Awards, the only time I went in the first row. And the first, he was up for the, you know, the supporting actor mm -hmm. in Oliver that had 12 nominations, I think got 11 Oscars. So the first Oscar was being given. And the guy who got, forget the actor who gave it. So he said, and the winner is Jack Albertson. Oh, oh my God. So that wow. was, that You're was halfway out of your seat. But you yeah. had you had Jack Wilde, who was now becoming a teen idol, staying with you and your family and your teenage girls. So how did that go over in the neighborhood? <laughs> well, that was not great. <laughs> he brought he brought his brother, her brother with him, which wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. But Jack was great, and he was like Mickey Rooney. This guy had more talent, and literally got messed up. You know, I don't want to say by his parents. But he, they took him back to London. And, you know, I mean, it just didn't happen for him. But it did while he was doing, you know, our show. Yeah. He was like the teen idol. Yeah, he, had so, he was just packed with talent, this guy. How old was oh, he at the time, uh, uh, Marty? When we, mm. when we got him. And, oh, no, he was the song and dance man. He was one of a kind. And uh, he was a, a big a big reason how the show got picked up. But of course, the star was always witchy poo. You know, she, <laughs> Billy Ace was great doing that part. Oh, wow. She... I'm going to do something with Puff and stuff that I can't talk about, but it's going to be a big surprise and hopefully a home run. Well, you, Wait, you, are you uh, holding on to headlines? Okay. <laughs> you know, you can't kill our shows with a baseball bat. And we only had 17 episodes, 17 episodes, eight episodes. We have Electric Woman and Diner Girl, which we're gonna do for the first time in animation. And uh, and it looks like we'll do it at Disney. So and that, that, that's at. very that, exciting. That really you, is. You mentioned Billy Hayes, who we lost fairly recently, correct? Right. Well, she was witchy poo. What a so full of energy. She was a fireball. And and Margaret Hamilton, the wicked witch of the East in The Wizard of Oz said, was a better witch than her because she was scary and funny. <laughs> which is a great combination. Oh, Margaret Hamilton thought that, that Billy Hayes was the best witch ever. And we had her on segment. We hired Margaret. I mean, let's face it, The Wizard of Oz mm -hmm. is still legendary. Mm -hmm. But Margaret you was know, supposed to be mostly yeah. scary. Yeah. She was supposed to be at all funny. You talked about the comedian, and I had Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor on his first thing, yep. That was, that was a trip. You know, so How did that happen? George were very, in a lot of ways, similar. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so I can't I, see Richard Pryor going, the guy that did H.R. Puff and stuff, I got to have this guy doing my comedy special. How did that happen? How that ha I'm in New York in the middle of the winter. It's a Meridian Hotel on the 20th floor overlooking the park and it's snow. And I had a meeting coming up to the room by Tim Henson. So I had a meeting with him and he asked me, what are you doing next? And I said, Richard Pryor. And I didn't have him. I hadn't met him on the show. So Jim Henson left the room and I said, oh, why did I tell him this? So then when I went back to LA, I called Skip Rittenham, who's an incredible lawyer, who represented, represented us way at the beginning. I said, look, I gotta get a meeting with Richard. You gotta do this for me. <laughs> so he got me a meeting at Warner Brothers. I figured there'd be 10 people in the room. The only two, was the lawyer 
and Richard. Richard said yes. He the four sketches. He said yes. Then two hours later, he said no. Then he said yes. Then he said no. So finally, I got to tell you, he said yes. And now we're building the sets. 300,000 we have into the sets. He comes to the studio with Skip and says, look, Skip says, we, we're sorry, but Richard doesn't want to do the show. Oh my God. I said, look, we have $300,000 into sets. You can't do this. She says, okay. He took out a check and they wrote it out for 300000 I wouldn't take it. So then I took Richard for a walk. He finally, he finally did it. But he said to me, whatever you do, Marty, don't ever call anybody that I know to be on this show. <laughs> I said, Richard, I never will. As soon as he walked out the door, I called Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> Wow. So what do you think explains the back and forth, the indecision? Did he just not want to have a variety show? Was that just too ordinary for... Richard Richard was sober. He went through an awful lot. He was, you know, off the screen. He was real serious. I guess I talked to him almost every night, not about the show. I don't know. Maybe he was lonely. It's just about life. So the last episode, though, he had a yellow Rolls Royce. He opened up the door. I kneeled down, talked to him for 20 minutes, and never saw him again. Oh. Where did that so, air? Where and when did that air? That was in the 80s. On what network? That was, six. that was after he got sober. Mm-hmm. And uh, then he, got, he married Jennifer Lee, divorced her, and she married him again, you know. Richard was a trip. Mm-hmm. It's kind one of like day, it's kind of like the show. One day he wants to do it, one day he doesn't. <laughs> one day he wants to be married, one day he doesn't. Well, one day he calls me up and he says, "Marty, uh, it was twelve o'clock. I'd like you to take a ride with me." And we were off of Sunset Boulevard, so I figured he's taking me to lunch. So I get in the I get in the car and he says to me, "No, I'm not taking the lunch. I'm going to my bank." <laughs> I said, "Why is that?" He said, "Because I heard they're going under." And I've got $2 million in the bank. So we're driving up Sunset towards Fairfax. But I figured he's going to make a left turn at Fairfax and find some small bank. He keeps driving to Century City. He pulls up by the Bank of America. Oh That's God. what he's going under. I said, Richard, if that goes under, <laughs> so does the rest of it. So that's, that's my Richard Price. What, oh, what that's network awesome. was that show on, Marty? That was on CBS. Oh, okay. Wow. See, we had we had CBS, NBC, and ABC, and that's all there was. Yeah, for sure. So every kid in America that watched Saturday morning saw. See, they didn't see the whole series. They saw most of what we did. Well, one one so, of. You know, did you know that you were providing some consistency for kids? Because a lot of kids don't have parents that that they know whether or not they're going to be there on Saturday morning, but you're going to be there. Well, you know, they all, they were loyal, but I'll give you the best loyalty. Mm -hmm. All those kids then grew up and I could stop 10 people on Times Square, 40, 50, and say, hey, mister, can you sing the theme song of one of the crop shows? Yeah. And they could sing the lyrics. Oh, yeah. So our fans that we have out there, I say there's 40 million fans, you know, they just are totally still with us. As a matter of fact, you and can I, go to your website and hear the soundtracks and sing along with the HR Puff and Stuff jingle, and it immediately comes back to mind. You get a whole list of all the jingles from all the shows right there. It's fun. You know, there was a convention two weeks ago called the Croft Con. Right. <laughs> Talk right about Right outside of Oakland and San Francisco. And you turned it into... Uh, we in the theater. And we had about 500 people, of which we signed autographs all day. I mean, if you heard these people, it was like wild. They all are like into <laughs> everything we did. And you turned so the whole gonna, the whole convention hall, you, you turned it into Living Island, correct? Right. And we're going to go on tour and do this. How, how, so do you, how, it, how can you make that portable? Well, you know, it's going to be 
we're going to be smart about it. Mm-hmm. The one we did up in, you know, Northern California, uh, I would say it takes only one truck. You know, you do a show in an arena, you got 10 trucks, and that kills you if you're not doing business. So we're going to keep the cost down. Mm-hmm. But you know, we have, look, we know how to make it look great, and we're going to have some entertainment. We're going to have some of the stars that were on our variety shows. We've got the stars that were on our shows. So there's going to be a lot to look at. And one thing we did do up there, we did the history of Croft, and it was narrated by uh, Rob Klein, mm-hmm. who like knows more about stuff in the archives. He was at Disney for five years. Mm-hmm. So this guy knows more about our shows than, than we do. Mm-hmm. So we got a lot of entertainment going. And we're going to go take it out on the, in the West Coast first and play about eight, ten cities, and then work our way towards the East Coast. So that's what we got planned. That oh, sounds wow. great. Marty, oh, yeah. uh, l- l- let's go back to um, the block that you carved out for yourself on Saturday mornings. That was back at a time when the FCC had a firmer grip on regulation on broadcast television. And the mandate was that stations had to supply a certain minimum number of hours of children's programming that you filled. Now, there's no regulation at all. How has it changed and how has that affected the business you were in? First of all, Fritz, you know too much. Uh I can't believe it. I'm sorry. You have a big background of knowledge. But you know, today, I think there's such an amount of everything it all comes together, and there are only a few standouts. Then, you know, you zeroed in on the three networks, and you always found something that was special. So today, I don't know. You, you don't have to, to really, you know, follow those rules. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to me, I don't think that's great. Look, they never inhibited us. You know, I remember when we did Land of the Lost, we, we met a woman called Floria Frompton from UCLA, and she did the Pakuni language, the land of the lost. That wound up being the educational, you know, plug that we were able to, to I'll tell you, you always did better if you had that, especially then. They're still looking for it now. The stations still want that kind of show. Right. I mean, we've got some people from CBS working on, you know, our, our original shows, and the stations are still looking for ways to have some educational input in them. Did, did the sponsors ride you at all, you know, being very aware of children's content, make sure everything was healthy and have suggestions? Well, I got to tell you, I don't think, you know, we weren't bothered much. Our shows were so different, nobody really bothered us. Mm-hmm. And the sponsors loved us. I mean, we were big with Coke, with Kellogg's, with Hasbro, and I don't remember ever having trouble with them. Mm. But there was, there's always people at networks to get involved, you know, and most of them or all of them have never produced anything. <laughs> so that's sure. what happens now also. Describe the, so, the creative uh, process of coming up, you know, because you kind of like broke the mold wide open in terms of what can be a character and what would be an inanimate object. I mean, you could turn anything into into a character. And so what was it like when you guys were creating and coming up with ideas? Where we're at, the most important thing when you create something is the idea. The idea is everything. Then you turn it over to other people and they either make it better or screw it up. But the idea is where it's at. So we had the ideas on just about everything. I mean, I can't think of the ones that we did that somebody else came up with the ideas. But we always had, you know, in the first four shows that we did, Puff, Bugaloos, Litzville, and Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, I had a close friend by the name of Cy Rose who had a big history of sitcoms. So I didn't know how to do a show. So I said, Cy, would you come and help us? So he well, he did McHale's Navy, uh, Dukes of Hazard, and a lot of special big shows. So it was mostly at Universal. So he he was really my teacher. 
And I did yeah, and you were credit. able to use him for casting because you had Bob Denver doing your shows. You had you had some of the stars. You crossed over stars from his other venues. Well, by the time I got to Bob Denver, he wasn't doing it. Oh. So that's what I did was I always found the stars whose shows were finished, canceled. So Jim Neighbors, same thing. You know, so we always had names like Jack Wilde. We got him, guys up for an Oscar, and we got him for a kid show. So, you know, that was mostly my job. Now, yeah, we, I just about got everybody that, that we had on these shows. Now, Witchy Poo is a person whose why me lament would indicate that she does not seem to understand how her behavior is impacting the outcome of events. <laughs> was she modeled after anyone you knew? No, she was playing herself. She did Bambi Oakham on Broadway. And little Abner, mm-hmm. and she had a one of a kind delivery. It was her. So when we're going to do Puff and stuff next, we're not going to do a reboot, you know, and make the thing a copy of her. Mm-hmm. We're going to reinvent the character because you got to be real careful when you do reboots. You can die real quick, mm-hmm. you know. So we want to do any reboots. But there was so, so much humanity in all all of the characters. There was like something to make the adults laugh. You were using impressions of a lot of famous people that the kids didn't know, and so you guys must have been having a lot of fun. Well, I don't know if I was having fun. I think everybody else was. Okay. But yeah. I added the comedy because he was the best at punch up. You know, it's very hard to find writers that can do punch up and do, you know, jokes and be horrible, you know, within a show. They can stick out and ruin you. You know, I always said if we have if I get three cringes in a half hour, I gotta <laughs> tell you if I got one cringe I can survive. Two are like a second degree burn. They almost <laughs> don't, don't heal. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. So, so uh, out of all these successful kid shows you did, is there a common thread that runs through them that makes a successful kid show? Like, what resonates? Is it the adventure? Is it the likable characters? Is it the no real danger? Or, or, or all those? What, what's the common well, thread? None of those. Oh. It's getting someone at a network to pick it up. Oh, there we go. And then- <laughs> then you make it happen okay. because one didn't tie into the other. But the fantasy and the look, we always kept what we call the cross look. Uh. We've kept the logo on our company. And, you know, and I got to tell you, I got another story for you. Okay. Dude, let's have it. Mm-hmm. We opened for Judy Garland, the Flamingo, first time she ever went out. Two years later, I'm sitting at the the polo lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and they flew in all these stars the opening night in in Vegas. But two years later, I'm sitting in the polo lounge with Judy, her husband, Sid Luft, Sinatra, his wife, and Tony Martin, and Sid Cherise. Wow. Yikes. And I was 22, 21. So we're there having a drink, and... This man, this old guy, comes over, and I find out later he saw Sister Reese's legs. She probably came over. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Walt Disney. Oh, wow. Whoa. Sat next to me, and uh, Judy said, you know, this is Marty Crook. He and his brother were my opening act, and you were there. You know, so he said, he looked at me, he said, kid, let me give you some advice. He said, don't ever sell ever what you create. And then he said, the next thing I'm going to tell you is the hardest thing to get. Always fight for your name above the title. So the only thing he never told me was how to save my money. So that's why I'm still working. <laughs> oh, wow. Those, wow. Are, those are words of wisdom. Are now, you did- I never saw him again. But then Clark Walker was his PR guy. Was his PR guy. Card Walker was named the next president. I bonded with him. Yep. I used to go sit with him once every couple of months in his office for lunch. Then, then uh, Walt Disney's son-in-law 
he became the head. He almost ruined the company. And then Michael Eisner came in, who was like my mentor. Mm -hmm. So I knew I knew the whole succession of Disney, but never really worked there. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of developments. But so now I may be. Maybe? Okay. Not an easy place, but it's still business. You outlasted all of them, Marty. It's fantastic. Now, um, uh, talk about your variety experience doing the Brady Bunch show. Okay. Oh, great. Well, the first thing is, was Donnie and Marie. So Fred Silverman and Michael Eisner called me into their office. And the first day Bob Iger worked at ABC, he came into that room, so I had all three. But Bob was quiet. So Fred says, look, we've got two kids. We don't know what to do with them. We want to give you the show. They're an opening act. I think they see that with Bob Hope in a state fair, come back and tell us what you want to do. So we came back and said, look, we don't want dancers. We want ice skaters from ice capades, 16 of them, <laughs> and a Donnie and Marie can't ice skate. So they'll do the comedy in the opening. They said, as soon as they heard it, they said, okay, you got it. So that's how we got that. So as far as the Brady Bunch hours, Michael Eisner was leaving ABC to go to Paramount. She says to me, you don't want to stay with Donnie and Marie in the third season. They were moving to Provo. I'm going to give you the Brady Bunch to be in a, to start a variety hour. So that's how we wound up with them. So you would start with Donnie and Marie, who were absolute singing, dancing, skating, juggling, musician, show business pros. And then you created a show for the Brady Bunch, who were actors. So that must have been a, li a, a little bit of a speed bump. And, and how did you manage it? Well, that was tough. They worked their tails off. But, they, you know, they, it, it was a tough medium for them. And they didn't totally pull it off. We, we surrounded them with great stars. But, you know, if you, your stars that are on every week, they got to make it. That's what the audience comes back to. So we got eight episodes. And the first one, we got like a 50 share, and then we kept going down, and we kept having better guests, you know. I mean, we got Donnie and Marie on, you know, we got Blondie, we got Alice Cooper, we, you know, <laughs> so we, we surrounded them. But I got to tell you, Florence Henderson worked at tail off. Mm -hmm. The kids there, too. They're still in my life, you know. Oh. I mean, when we got the star on, Hollywood Boulevard, Chris Knight was there, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, a couple others were there wishing us well. So, you know, we never lost any of our stars. And you said Greg was a key player because he was a good singer and an all-around performer. Barry. Barry, rather. Yeah. Barry was good. He was, he's a, he was a great performer, still is, you know, so we're close with him. You know, they worked with us outside of the show, so we had known them. I mean, we worked with the Jacksons in the 70s, you know, so we, we had, we were around after we did Puff and Stuff, and we were around very big time before, you know. Talk about songwriting, I mean, because you always surrounded yourself with, I, I think what, in addition to the sets and the costumes and the puppets, you guys are kind of known for your music. So talk about songwriting. Well, I mean, the first uh, Puff and Stuff after we did, the first season, you know, while we were doing it, I went to, to Lou Wasserman and said, I want to do a movie on Puff and stuff. So he said, oh, how much is it? I said, a million dollars. I made the number up. And he said, oh, that's a lot of money. I said, what if I get half the money from Kellogg's? He said, well, then I'll do it. So he thought he'd never see me again. <laughs> but I got, the, I got half the money. And so I did the movie Then I was looking for writers. So I found Charlie Fox in New York. Mm -hmm. Charlie Fox and Norman Kimball were partners. So I got them. They moved out to L.A. for us, got them to write the score. And then Charlie wrote a real small song after he did Puff and Stuff called Killing Me Softly. Oh so that was, you know, I had uh, Sammy Kahn and Jimmy Van Usen. Wow. Sammy Kahn. Sinatra. Mm -hmm. That was before 
you know, that was before all this. He, they, they did a, a whole, they did a whole album with us. So they were great. I mean, uh, Sammy Khan was a trip. <laughs> now, you must know who that is, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So, you I know, mean, we had, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that's the kind of talent I always look for. The guys who did the monkeys, I hired them. I had the Osmond brothers write some of the show. Oh, they're songs. Really, yeah, really talented. Yeah. I mean, when you were ca- when you were casting the the Bugaloos, was that before or after they were casting the Monkeys? Oh no, that was way before. Yeah, so you were the first to kind of like customize a a, yeah. a group, correct? Well, we went to England after we did Jack Wild, and that was the British invasion. So I had them lined up for three blocks in the winter audition for the Bugaloos. So that's how that started. And you had some interesting people audition who were thrilled to not have gotten the, the role, correct? Oh, you got it. <laughs> you're, you're now you're really, you guys know too much. <laughs> <laughs> you know too much. So yeah, we had some, you know, Elton John's partner. He Bernie always thanked me for not picking him. Yeah. <laughs> he said, you were in my career. So every time Elton came to the Hollywood Bowl, he sent me four tickets. <laughs> well, you know you. that. Well, well, while you mention that, that that in terms of California, uh, the 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 tip of the pyramid in California show business culture, the fact that they did the Sid and Marty Croft musical night at the Hollywood Bowl is pretty impressive. We did do that. We did twelve thousand people. Wow, crazy! We, we did do it. You know that we came up with this. We were going into the Hollywood Bowl for one night and then I decided on Tuesday of that week why don't we do a special so I called up a syndicator and got somebody to do it and by Friday we you know that's when we did the show we did a special you know so that we still have oh by the way the one star that also thanked us was Phil Collins (laughs) oh my Yeah, because yeah. he, he was in Genesis the year after he auditioned for the Bugaloos. That would have been a different career path. Yeah, but um, you all, you all, you also kind of take a lot of joy in creation, and you're you're someone who's not afraid to learn from failure. So talk about some of the really interesting concepts that you had that really never made it. I gotta tell you, we have a warehouse with all of our stuff. Wow, at one big development called M13, based on astrology. Mm-hmm. That was about the only one who we created that didn't get on. So we really, our batting average, I mean, we did about 20 pilots, got 18 on the air, and 16 were hits. Joe DiMaggio didn't have a, a batting average like that. <laughs> no, he didn't. Well, you you learned the the fine art of show business, which is diversification, because you did not only these great shows, you made props for huge rock shows. You built puppet shows for major theme parks like Six Flags. Talk about all your ancillary businesses and where they are. Well, a guy came to us through, he owned, I think he owned the Holiday Inn in Atlantic City, and he was going to build something called... Uh, oh shit! <laughs> What's the name of the the thing where the little kids go for their birthday? Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck E. Cheese. Thank you. I've, so I spent a good portion of my it. retirement at Chuck E. Cheese. We want you to help us create it and also build the characters. So we did it, and then he comes to me and he says, "Look, you have two choices. I'll give you a piece of the company." Oh, I'll give you $100,000. I said to myself, this thing is never going to work. Oh, man. Uh. Okay, so that's where that is. Still going on. Did wow. you guys make a lot of money on merchandising, though? Because I, I can, I'm can, i picturing a lot of dolls of Puff and stuff, and that exists, correct? Let me tell you about money. Yeah. I just said to me one day, you really made a big mistake, Marty. You took the wrong way out with the entertainment industry. You should have done what I do. He said, 
you would have been running a studio by now. But you know what you did? You went for the fame and not the cash. And that was, <laughs> so that's why we're still working. Well, I don't we know never went true. for cash. You no. know, we were never a, a money company. And how did you and your brother operate as a team? Like, what were your roles? Well, my brother was totally in the end, in the creative side. Mm -hmm. And I was split among, amongst the business and the creative. Mm -hmm. And I never could, I never kept score on the creative side. But I'll tell you, the most creative thing I probably did, I got all these shows on the air. Yeah. And that was, now, I would whisper all my ideas to my brother, and I didn't need to, to keep score on that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's hard to do these shows and not, you know, my brother just did that. You know, he, he was not somebody that wanted to come to the studio every day. Mm. So he did. So I'll leave it at that. I, 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 Marty, think that one of the funniest people that's ever appeared on television was Charles Nelson Riley. And so talk about Lidsville and doing Charles. I watched the clips on your website, and it still makes me laugh out yeah, loud. He doesn't even have to say anything, and Charles, I laugh at him. Charles was a trip. Charles didn't want to do it. I said, Charles, see what she pulled? It took her, took us an hour and a half to do the makeup. We can do your makeup in probably 45 minutes. We won't torture you. Well, the makeup took three hours. Oh, no. He hated me. Oh, no. <laughs> but there was nobody as good as him. He was great. Such a funny man. Great improviser. So how did you come up with the concepts for the show? Because it usually involves some some young person or maybe a family somewhere that where they do not feel familiar. I'll give you one thing. Mm-hmm. Lizville. Yeah. Land the hatch. Yeah. Brother claimed he ran, ran on the beach for nine hours a day. No, nine miles a day. Okay. He wore a different hat. So he said, I want to do a show with hats. Okay. <laughs> Let me give you a segment. Yeah. Brother's on a, with a friend of his, on some rocks facing the ocean in La Jolla. He sees this big piece of seawood, seaweed mm -hmm. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. He goes down and gets it, puts it in the back seat of his Corvette, and calls it Sigmund. <laughs> yet, yet to verify the story. <laughs> That's how that one happened. So, you know, that, you know, with the, with the land of the lost, we knew we wanted to do a great family, and the, the dinosaurs were secondary. Nobody had done dinosaurs then on TV. So, you know, that's basically where we're at. But it was so also in interesting to watch the kids interact with the native kids there and learn each other's languages and, and see each other as valuable. And so there was, a, there was a lot of messaging going on that was, I think, interesting for kids to, to well, watch. We had messages that were under the underground. You know, we had the look and puff and stuff. The humor is adult. But we never went that far over the kid's head. Mm -hmm. it was always a message. Doctor Blinky was had a house and puff and stuff. Because at the top of the chimney, he had an ice bag because he smoked too much. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like that was one thing. I want to talk about DC Follies because it was one of the first political satire shows. And you even had life-size puppets of Richard Nixon. I would like to own that. I'd like to have that in my den. And Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, it, it had a short life because the writer's strike sort of nipped it in the bud. But that was a pretty forward-thinking show. Talk about the, the development of that show. Well, first of all, that was the only syndicated show we ever did. And that hurt us. You never knew what time it was on and what, what day. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we made a comedy star at the bottom of Richard Nixon's career. We turned him into a comedy star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what we did, I can look at those shows now, and a lot of them hold up. Yeah. Oh yeah, the they do. So we, yeah, we would like to do something like that again. I tried by giving two guys 
put him on the news every day with three two-minute pieces, Putin and and uh, Trump. Oh, my gosh. Perfect. It didn't work. Didn't work. Oh, uh, this week it would work. <laughs> You know, and I think the greatest casting ever, in, and you got this woman to go way outside her comfort zone, was Betty White as a stripper. <laughs> yeah. Right. That was good. But, you know, look, we cast that show perfectly. Mm-hmm. You know, and that show was funny. And people went home on Friday night to watch it. I think we could use it now, Marty. We, we tried to do it. But we haven't been able to conquer it yet. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what happens. You are always working and always thinking and always creating. So what should we start getting excited about? Mondays at Marty. Oh, you yeah, said Mondays you have 40 Marty, million yeah. fans that you, you found out about at CroftCon. And you do a little chat called Mondays at Marty that has a big viewership. Talk right, about on it. YouTube, on his YouTube channel. Well, I got to tell you, you know, I started doing it. My brother was doing this Instagram. So I decided to do my own. And short, my brother does it for, I think, a half hour or an mm-hmm. hour. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm trying to tell the stories behind the scenes and give the audience more inf- interesting information. So, look, I've done about 12 of them so far. And uh, they're easy to do. I do them in the office. And I do them without a script. And uh, they're really fun. Okay. Well, you know, we pull it off. You're right. People and what's like fun them. is, it, as I mentioned before, it drives it to the other content. You have great memories on your website. You've got the, the, the soundtracks from the various shows, and it's kind of fun to just play along. It turns over a rock on an earlier part of all of our lives. It's a lot of fun. Well, that's why the adults are important to us. You know, the adults are where it's at. So that's why we're going out with CrossCon. We're going to go hit the road. Because that we found out two weeks ago that the fans are out there. We had 500 who were like flipping out every last one. So we know what we did right. We know what we did wrong. And we're going to get this thing. We're going to get this thing going. Oh yeah, and no. it's mostly for the fans. You know, we've never known how to make a lot of money. Okay, mm-hmm. and that that's just the way it goes. So we've never worked for money mm-hmm. and we've never created shows because there was a toy out there mm-hmm. so we tried to stay away from that no we didn't try we did well That's i would the, like correct. i would like to recommend if you are a, a baby boomer or younger who grew up watching the croft shows watch them again watch them now as an adult you're going to see something different and in them and you're going to experience them you know with new awareness of what you've now uh, experienced in your lifetime and so and they're great just across the board for little kids and for people that have had you know more life experiences they're just fantastic so uh i highly recommend doing that because i did that to research for this show i rewatched puff and stuff and appreciated it on a different level that's great you know it's important to have adults I wouldn't hire somebody that didn't grow up with the shows. Oh, oh that's interesting. Correct. You know, I, I want that. They had goosebumps when they saw, saw these shows, wow. and they still have them. If you would have seen 500 people coming by my table talking to me, I, I flipped out. I couldn't believe it. What do they say? You tell know, us, that. share with us a little bit about what they tell you. What they tell me? Yeah. I changed their life. They wouldn't have been in the career they were in if it wasn't for us. Wow. You know, so that was... I, I have to tell you another thing quick. Yeah. I went on the weekend because my fiancé as a kid who's 18 who wanted to go to the anime convention. Yeah. Have you heard of the anime? Oh, oh yeah, yes, absolutely. Well, this was in Riverside. I got there in the morning. They were lined up five blocks to get mm-hmm. in. Yeah. Like a bench. So, you know, of course, I knew the agent that booked a lot of the talent. So I got I got her kid Aww. close. To her, but I couldn't believe what was going on. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean this was like a home run. They had about 15,000 people there. Yeah. Mostly young. Yeah. Almost all. 
No, it speaks to them. They uh, they identify it, you know, who they are through what they love or who, you know, what programming. I mean, just like kids did when you were, you know, when they were watching the shows that you created, you know, you kind of see well, yourself I, in these characters. I mean, one of them, I can't think of her name. She's like very popular in the sky, this young guy. They were signing autographs and the agent said to me, hey, he's got... They each collected about 75000 in the one day. For appearing. Wow, for appearing. Wow. Marty, if you don't mind, uh, I, I would like to reflect on a few friends and former cast members that you lost. You commented about Billy Hayes, who was this wonderful fireball of a talent. What about Bob Saget? Well, Bob Saget I knew, but I think he only did one thing with us. Mm-hmm. Just a special guy, you know. That was a sad moment. I, mean, I don't even know what happened. No, so. I don't think anybody does. That was very sad. No. What about Betty whole... White? Any any thoughts on your working with Betty White? Well, Betty White was a trip. You know, <laughs> Betty White. Wait, what was the thing? I Did... went to her house once. Yeah. To get a script, and I heard about twenty dogs in the house. Oh, wow. <laughs> I asked her, do any of them bite? She said, they all bite. bite. <laughs> that's a lovely person. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. Who else? No, that's it. You've outlived everybody else. We'd be here all day. We're talking about people. I don't know. Several of them have died. But... But you're well, such an inspiration. I'll, I'll tell you, to hear your enthusiasm for show business and that your mind is still working like a well-oiled machine coming up with ideas and talking about marketing and talking about how to make a project successful, it's pretty inspirational at your age. You're the last of the titans. And I, I just want to uh, like let folks know that they have uh, the Crofts have a wonderful website. That they have a Facebook. They have Instagram. They have Twitter. They have TikTok. And so there's a oh lot going God. on in the YouTube channel. I don't even have TikTok. Just check out the YouTube channel. Just go there right now when you're done listening to this podcast. There's, uh, there's so many memories that are just going to pop off the screen into your heart and uh, make you feel warm and cozy and like pouring yourself a nice bowl of cereal <laughs> to, to recapture those feelings of, you know, what it felt like to, to enjoy these shows, this mu the music, the colors, the sets, the puppets, uh, the comedy. You know, so much of it was just way, way ahead of its time. And, and it, you know, it, to, to do that all live, you know, with no CGI and stuff, you guys were geniuses. And I just... It just, it's, I'm so thrilled that it's being celebrated. And so do I, do I have time for one short story? Yes, course, please, please. Not. Please. Okay. Last March 21st, I'm at Gelson's at the bakery counter. And a woman comes over to me, about 45 years old, I guess. And she saw an emblem on my jacket. It was very dull. It said Land of the Lost. Mm -hmm. So she walks over to me, hesitant. She was hesitant and said, Are you Sid or Marty? Oh my gosh. So I said, well, I'm Marty, the good looking one. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Oh my God. My effing mother, if she, <laughs> if I was here, you would die. She's 85 and she would flip out. So she had more effings than I ever said. <laughs> And now, so I, I liked her, and I, you know, so I said to her, what do you do? She said, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. I said, well, just hang in. I said, you know, let me tell you what my father told me. Don't ever, ever give up, because if you give up on Tuesday, there is no Wednesday, oh. and Wednesday could have been the day. Yeah. She said, oh, my God. My mother goes, oh, I said, <laughs> so, okay. So then I said to her, Look, I'm going to give you my card. And I don't give it out. And I want you to send me an email. And I said, let me tell you about this card. I gave it to a woman three months ago. And she sold it on eBay for $100. Wow. She said to me, could I have three cards? <laughs> <laughs> I love I her. I said to her, look, send me an email. So she sent me an email the next day. I never answered it. I'm sitting at art a month later. And this girl comes over with all tattoos, and she says to me, my mother loves you. 
So I didn't pay attention, but my girlfriend said, you know, start talking to her. And then the girl put her mother on FaceTime. And that was it. And they left. And the next thing I knew, two weeks later, I got an offer for $4,000 to be on a show, Better Things. So this was Pamela Hadley, oh, who was talking to me, who's the star, the writer of that show. The show's a home run. So now I'm, I've bonded with her. See? I did the show, and I had one of my daughters, Christina, who's an actress, work with me because I said, I can't do this. You so stuck your dream. What we did. You stuck your dream as an actor, and after all this time, it finally came true. And if you had given up, Wednesday never would have arrived. That's fantastic. Wednesday That's right. was the day. That slogan went all over the world on her show. Oh wow! I, she, she is like close to me now. She's and I gave her a Freddie the flute. You know, she she now she's going to New York to do a to direct a movie. Oh but my I God. never heard of her before. I always wanted a Freddie the Flute. Want... I wanted Freddie oh. the Flute. Yeah, I, I wanted to well, keep it in my it. pocket. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, he, we want to thank you so much, Marty. I'm going to read the closing and credits right now. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You will find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. You can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. Unlike Marty, we will write back. If you enjoy the show, <laughs> please give us a nice rating in Apple Podcasts. You, you guys are special. You are prepared. <laughs> Thank you it so much. Worth- it was so much fun, Marty. And I'll tell you, when, when you get... Uh, CroftCon up and running and it's doing a tour and you want to talk about it, come back and join us again. Yeah, we would love that. And we'll come. We'll come to the festival. We'll invite you too. Oh, That'd I'd be awesome. That. Of course. Let me plug some gigs here. Oh, yeah. Oh, Fritz has some upcoming gigs, Marty. Yeah, Marty, excuse me. Yeah. So if you're listening to this the week it's originally posted, that is before Saturday, June 11th, I would invite you to uh, the Camino Real Playhouse in San Juan Capistrano this Saturday, the 11th. I'm doing two shows down there at 5 and 8 o'clock. It's a wonderful little venue. Great places to get little meals around there. July 21st at Feinstein's at Vitello's. Great upstairs showroom. An evening hosted by the great Wendy Lieben. And I'll be joined by a pioneer lady stand-up, Carol Liefer, who also... Also wrote on Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I'll be joining one of our former guests, Mark Arthur Miller, who is a wonderful soul and R&B singer. I'll be opening for him at the legendary Catalina Bar and Grill off Sunset on Sunday, August 7th. Consult your internet devices. All right. You can sign up for our fun and dishy newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com. We want to thank our wonderful guest, Marty Croft. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman and Marty Croft, and we will see you along the media path. <laughs>